So Tim, uh, we'd, like, we'd like to start the, uh, today's jamboree, so please uh, start your presentation. Okay. Um, let me start with uh, my introduction. Uh, probably a lot of you have heard me talk before at these jamborees, but my name is Tim Bird, and I'm uh, an employee of Sony Mobile, and uh, I am the uh, architecture group chair for the CE work group of the Linux Foundation. And uh, today I'd like to kind of give my traditional talk on the status of embedded Linux. And unfortunately, I need to apologize up front. Uh, I was doing my slides. Uh, they started in PowerPoint, and then I wanted to do some stuff on Linux uh, while I was looking up some stuff. Uh, and then I converted them over to uh, Open Office. Uh, and then when I tried to convert them back, I had lots of formatting problems. And so I was, uh, you'll see some formatting problems with my slides, and I apologize for that. But hopefully, the information is all correct. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. The formatting doesn't, problems don't start until about slide 20 or 30 or something, so the first part is okay. Uh, but let's go ahead and start. So I'm going to cover these major areas. Uh, I'm going to talk about the kernel versions a little bit, um, and then go through some specific technology areas, talk a little bit about the CE workgroup projects, uh, get, go over some other miscellaneous stuff uh, that's going on in the industry right now, and then uh, give some links to some resources that I use to find this information. So, next slide. So let's start with kernel versions. Uh, next slide. Uh, the basic idea is that the pace of the kernel versions is very consistent and it's very good. The kernel processes are working well. Uh, there's another kernel summit coming up in um, August in association with LinuxCon North America. And they'll continue to refine the processes, but they've been doing pretty well, uh, averaging about 70 days or a little over two months for a kernel release. If you see, uh, about a year ago, uh, we had the 3.11 release, um, and we've had six releases uh, since then, or we're, we're on the sixth release now. We're, at, we're currently at 3.16 RC6, and I always like to make a prediction, see how far off I am, so next slide. I predict this one will be 69 days. That's not a very bold prediction uh, to have it be just one day short of the other, uh, the, the recent three projects. But um, that was right before uh, LinuxCon North America. LinuxCon is, uh, I think, August 20th is when it starts. So we'll see. I'll, uh, I'll be able to check with the people there and see if uh, Linus has done it. Um, and also, at the end of this presentation, I used to actually go version by version through the kernel and talk about specific things that happened in each version. Uh, but I got to the point where I didn't think that was as useful. I still have the information, but it's at the end of the slides. Uh, instead, I'm just going to go through the different technology areas. So next slide. So technology areas, and these are roughly alphabetical. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, boot up time. It, you can boot a kernel in, about, in under one second, but it still takes a lot of work. And uh, there are lots of resources available to help you tune the kernel, uh, specifically the, the elinux.org boot time page. Uh, there was a really good presentation at ELC uh, just this last April um, by Michael Optenacker. Uh Free Electrons is one of the companies in the embedded space. They do a lot of contract work, and they've done quite a bit of stuff with boot time. Anyway, his, uh, his title is... Uh, presentation is titled Update on Boot Time Reduction Techniques with Figures. He's got some great information in there. In fact, uh, he has information that I have not seen before, and I'll talk a little bit about a couple of things that he mentioned uh, that uh, I, have, I have not seen before. So that's, that's a really good presentation. Uh, you notice that the kernel is not really the focus as much anymore. It's really more on user space. Lots of people are looking at System D in the embedded space. We had uh, several proposals from uh, developers to talk about System D and how it's being used and embedded for ELC Europe. Uh, so we'll probably have a talk or two on that uh, coming up in October. So that will be good uh, if you're interested in that. In terms of to kind of technologies for, for boot, up, boot up time, just a couple of miscellaneous items. If you are using uh, UBIFS, uh, make sure that you have something called UBI Fast Map turned on. Uh, this was available, it was mainlined in 3.7, and the CE workgroup uh, supported that effort uh, by funding the contractor for that. 
Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of a focus on firmware. Uh, there's lots of U-boot optimizations in Michael's talk. A lot of times, uh, if you're using, uh, well, in a, a lot of times in Embedded, we're using custom uh, boot time. At least we are at Sony. Uh, but a lot of people are just kind of using stock uh, general purpose bootloaders like U-boot. And U-boot actually provides a lot of optimizations you can do. Uh, some, of, some of the things that you can actually do, if you kind of understand uh, how to configure U-boot and use it properly, you can avoid copying the kernel. You can make sure the kernel lands in the right place to start with uh, when, you, when it is moved from flash to RAM. Uh, you can use different compression uh, algorithms. Uh, U-boot actually has quite a bit of scripting in it, and so you can, you can trim down that scripting. You can actually trim down the size of U-boot. U-boot has a set of configuration options. You can actually modularize it and split it into two pieces. So there's a, a first stage bootloader and a second stage bootloader. There's a whole bunch of techniques. Most of them are covered in Michael's talks, but they're also uh, available if you look at U-boot documentation. I am actually really looking forward to Embedded Linux Conference Europe. Um, U-boot was kind of, a, kind of a stale topic for a couple of years. There was not a lot of new information, but it appears, to be, it appears that people are trying some uh, interesting new things, and we'll hear about them in, in ELC Europe. Uh, I just got through, uh, we're in the middle of the proposal review per period now, and so I've seen some of the abstracts, and I think there'll be some interesting interesting talks there. The big long-term problem I see in boot-up time is that no one has uh, figured out how to automate the process of reducing the system for boot time. So there's still a lot of manual work uh, every time you try to reduce uh, the system for boot time. And I, that's something I'd actually like to talk to other kernel developers about, see if there's ways to automate some of this stuff. Um, and I have a couple of ideas, but uh, that, so we seem to, we cover the same things over and over again. Even in Michael's presentation, he's talking about stuff that we've been talking about for three or four years, the same techniques, but you still have to manually apply them. And uh, there should be a way to automate some of this stuff. Anyway, that's boot up time. In terms of file systems, a uh, couple, just a couple of miscellaneous things. Uh, the file systems, uh, the flash file systems in the kernel have not changed a whole lot. Uh, they're getting kind of more featureful. There's a couple of things uh, here. So just recently, um, they did change a little bit how the resume code worked uh, and the startup code for uh, the uh, file system code. This applies to all file systems, um, all, all block device layers, but it was particularly important for spinning media uh, hard disk drives uh, via the SATA interface. Anyway, what they did was they did some asynchronous startup. And so instead of waiting for the drive to spin up, they can now go off and uh, do some initialization work. And uh, some of the reports on that were that there were about a 10, 10 times reduction in uh, resume speed. Oh, and I apologize, I meant to put that. There was an LWN.net article on this. Um, and I think I have the link to it in the, in the kernel-specific portion uh, that's after the presentation. The, uh, but anyway, so that's uh, being able to asynchronously start the disk uh, really helps overlap uh, some of the resume operations. What they found when they looked at it closely was that the system was just idling, was just halted. Uh, waiting for the disks to spin up, and it could have been doing other initialization work. Uh, so anyway, that's that's pretty nice. The other thing uh, that has been added recently, and we talked about this quite a bit uh, a couple of years ago in the CE uh, Linux forum, was there's now a block layer that's available on the UBI flash translation layer. So it's read-only for now, um, but, oh, and these last two ones are are supposed to be outdented. Uh, but anyway, so you can now put any file system uh, on top of UBI, uh, any, any block file system. So you can put ext4. Uh, at the moment, you cannot put a read. You can, you can put any file system, but you can't make it read-writable. So that's limiting, but, it, uh, but there's, uh, I think there's work in progress to fix that. Some of the other things we're seeing is uh, optimizations in IOs, the IO scheduler for solid state drives. Uh, so flash bake drives can handle a lot more I.O. operations per second um, than, than rotating media. And there's actually been a restructuring of the code in the 
in the I.O. scheduler, um, uh, there's now kind of a two-tiered uh, system for scheduling the work uh, and some per-processor uh, structures that make this much more efficient. So that's actually very good news. There's a lot of uh, CE products that are using um, uh, uh, solid-state drives or flash-based drives, and, and so this is a big help in terms of performance. Uh, next slide. In terms of memory management, the only the only thing I could really see that was kind of uh, groundbreaking here is uh, the IO the Ion memory allocator, which is Android's uh, memory allocator that they use for uh, sharing buffers between uh, like the video and the camera and stuff like that. That is actually now been mainlined. It's up in staging. It's not kind of in that staging tree where it's a little bit uh, not quite official, but it's it's there and you can make use of it and. Uh, without having to add extra patches. So that's kind of nice. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of power management, uh, there was this evolution of power management in Linux. Um, so some of these are kind of old uh, things. Suspend and resume. Then we went through voltage and frequency scaling. Uh, we went to longer sleep, which was tick reduction, runtime device power management, and then race to sleep, which was wake locks or auto sleep. And we're seeing a couple of new crazy things, mostly in, the, in terms of power we're scheduling, but even that seems to be kind of stalled at the moment. So next slide. So auto, the, kind of the, the big things we're seeing currently, we see auto sleep. The auto sleep patches have been in the tree for, gosh, probably uh, over a year now. And uh, people are just using them. Uh, I believe Android has started to switch over to them. I'm not positive. In terms of power where scheduling, uh, the big news there is big dot little scheduling. Some products are actually now shipping with this, um, and the support is now mainline. So not only are products shipping with it, but it's made its way actually up into the tree. I, I believe it's, there's a Samsung processor uh, that has the, its big dot little uh, scheduling implementation up up it, up stream. Um, however, the baseline power aware patches seem to be stalled. Um, so. I haven't seen much uh, going on there. The last news on this, reported on LWN.net at least, was uh, uh, last fall. So it's been almost a year, we're coming up on a year, uh, since we've seen any action on this. So we'll have to see what happens with it. It's a pretty thorny problem. Uh, the, other, the other areas that I've talked about before are memory power management and full tick lists. And uh, we may continue to see some interesting stuff there. Uh, next slide. Uh, just in terms of what power aware scheduling is, it consists of uh, trying to migrate tasks uh, between processors to allow C more CPUs to go idle. Um, so you move large tasks to faster CPUs, you try to do race to idle on those tasks, and you try to get, try to pull tasks off of, the normal, normal scheduler is going to try and distribute tasks evenly across the processors and try it in order to give you performance on all your different tasks. And so this is a classic uh, power versus performance trade-off. There are some good resources here. Um, Ingo Molnar, the reason this is kind of stalled is that Ingo Molnar uh, kind of blocked some of the patches last fall. I wanted to uh, consolidate a lot of the power handling or the power scheduling knowledge into the scheduler. Uh, rather than sp spread it out into other systems. And uh, so I think people are kind of dealing with that feedback and working around uh, those issues that you raised. And then this is, uh, I just <laughs> left this in because this is kind of my favorite slide that I, I put together. The, uh, this is my analogy for big dot little. You have a drag racer and a little uh, uh, underpowered car kind of strapped together. And the trick is to figure out how to make it uh, as efficient as possible. Uh, in terms of power, anyway, that's just for fun. Um, in terms of system size, this has really been interesting. There's been a renewed interest uh, in system size due to the Internet of Things. And uh, several projects were described at uh, Embedded Linux Conference. I was really surprised. I didn't think anybody was working on size issues. It turns out there's a whole bunch of people. Uh, so there's a couple of different projects, MicroYocto and Linux for Microcontrollers. There's been some recent work on kernel size and uh, a new tool uh, to deal with shared library size. So I'll cover those in a little bit more detail. So um, because of the Internet of Things, uh, it's 
now desirable. It was always desirable to run Linux in very constrained devices, but now it's even more constrained. So we just kind of got lazy as our embedded systems got uh, fatter and fatter, had more memory. Uh, we just stopped kind of working on uh, Linux Tiny and some of those things to, to really cut Linux down. A lot of our consumer electronics devices have pretty capable processors and lots of RAM. Uh, but that's not true for some segments. Uh, so wearables might need smaller footprints, but per in particular, a lot of Internet of Things things, little tiny sensors that need to last a long time on battery. One, one of the things that's really interesting is uh, there's a lot of talk about eliminating uh, dynamic RAM just for the power savings. And so there's uh, a lot of people talking about converting over to uh, SRAM or uh, SDM RAM, that's spin torque uh, MRAM. Uh, and those are technologies that require no, have no current draw when the processor is idle. And so um, if you can eliminate the DRAM on your system, uh, you can get much better battery life. Uh, you're not having to keep the, that memory refresh going. It seems like it's a very small current, but when you're talking about trying to live on a coin cell for uh, years, uh, you really have to shave everything off and uh, DRAM is not really workable. Um, so if you get small enough, uh, it turns out you could possibly work with the on DRAM in some of the modern uh, microcontrollers. And so here we are, we find ourselves, uh, what is it, 2014, and we're finding ourselves back to wanting to get Linux running in two meg or less of RAM. And uh, that's pretty interesting that there's kind of this renewed interest after all these years. So next slide. So there's a couple of projects out there that are doing a lot of good work here. So First one is the Micro Yocto project. Uh, this is being kind of led by Tom Zanussi at Intel. And they actually have um, the kernel running in uh, kernel and a network stack and a little distro running in 1.6 megabytes of SRAM and 8 mega flash. So notice there's no DRAM in the equation at all. Um, and there's lots of kernel uh, and user space reductions that they've done, including the net diet patches config proc min, oh this is, I can see this is the start of my bad formatting, so I apologize. None of this indentation is correct, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Uh, they also included link time optimization patches by Andy Kling, uh, the lightweight IP, so in stream cases they even cut the, the networking, the IP stack out of the kernel, and they just run a very, very small network stack in user space. Um, and and they, they found that they couldn't use the existing tracers, they didn't start early enough, and they were too heavyweight, so they actually implemented their own tracing systems. And uh, overall, they've done a lot of work uh, to really focus in on, on reducing on the RAM. It's a really good project. So next slide. So the other project is uh, this thing called Linux for Microcontrollers. I don't know if it actually has an official name, but this was described by Vitaly Wool. And uh, uh, there's a, they're a consulting company uh, I believe in Russia, anyway, they were trying to fit Linux on a microcontroller. That's not new, there's UC Linux. So these are MMU-less systems. Uh, but he went even more aggressive and went for a system that only had 256K of SRAM and a two meg NOR flash. Now he had to back out, back up several kernel versions to get one that could fit in that. But it's really interesting, he actually did accomplish it. And they had a specific use case where uh, where they, they wanted to keep everything just on die uh, for their solution. The flash usage is pretty interesting. Uh, they have a very small bootloader, 64K bootloader, about 900K of kernel text. That was with a lot of reductions, a lot of effort to make that small. Um, and then uh, about an 800K root file system and uh, about 196K config file system, so that's the only, the read-write portion of their file system was only 196K. Most of this other stuff was, uh, was um, read-only. And then only 256K of RAM. Uh, so that's very impressive, and uh, uh, the, the trick will be to see if that is even possible, if we can even approach that with a modern kernel, like a 316, 315 and 316 kernel. And that'll, that is actually going to be a subject of uh, discussion at the Kernel Summit uh, coming up. One of the items that uh, looks like is on the agenda is uh, talking about these size issues and uh, how, how important this is and whether we can achieve it. 
Anyway, two, two very interesting projects. Okay, next slide, that's right. So, uh, so in association with these projects, there have been a bunch of different patches uh, that were put together. Andy Clean did the net diet patches. Uh, last year, he worked on the link time optimization. There's something called the min proc, which is essentially the proc file system. It'd be nice to get rid of the proc file system completely, but it turns out that you need it for just kind of basic operation because that's how you get uh, things like uh, PS to work. Um, and then uh, lots of work around configurable syscalls and configurable kernel features, and those are some of the can see some of the things that they made configurable. However, when they started, so so they presented this stuff, and when they actually, and people were pretty excited about it at PLC, but when they went to go mainline them, they got a little bit of pushback from, uh, particularly the networking guys did not want to mainline main them. Uh, but there was a, some good discussion, and I think we'll have some discussions at the kernel summit, and we'll kind of see where we go with this. Hopefully we can get some of this mainline uh, after we address some of the concerns that uh, developers had. Uh, next slide. Oh, the other kind of interesting thing uh, I saw uh, at ELC was uh, there's a new tool. Now, I don't know how new it is, but it's new to me. I had never heard of it before, but it's uh, called MakeLibs. And it cuts down the shared libraries to match a specific set of executables. Uh, there was actually a tool that Monta Vista had done many years ago called LibOpt that did this. Uh, but this one is um, very easy to use and it's readily available and it's, it, it's actively maintained. LibOpt uh, stopped being maintained, I think. Uh, this is really useful for large li libraries like OpenGL and Qt. It's really useful uh, in when you have a, a, what they call a closed uh, system. So this is a system where you're not going to, you, you have a fixed set of applications, you're not installing new applications, because once it's stripped the libraries down, those are the symbols you have. You, you can't uh, install any other applications, they might have dependencies on, on APIs or function calls that are, that are not in your shared libraries. The great thing about this is that it does not require source, so it goes in and actually modifies the libraries at the, uh, at the ELF level. Uh, it, it, this is true of all systems like this. Uh, there's a little bit of a warning. You may miss DL open libraries. There are some ways to work around that by kind of uh, putting in a stub app that force calls those libraries uh, just for the purposes of uh, keeping them in the dependency tree. Uh, but it's available in Yocto uh, now, I guess, and I was completely unaware of it. Uh, it's not in build root as of 2013, but uh, but there you go. So there's a tool out there for reducing shared libraries. This is something we've talked about, and uh, and so there's a nice <coughs> or a system size. So next slide. Okay. In terms of security, uh, not a huge number of things. There are, there's been a lot of stuff going on with uh, UAFI, which is Secure Bootloader, but that's um, more in the context of Chromebooks um, and. Uh, and other systems, desktop systems, laptop systems. One of the things I saw was um, they are adding, they continue to add security features to the kernel, ind independent of kind of the mandatory access security things like SE Linux or SMAC. But they have uh, this kernel address-based la layout randomization, which actually uh, puts the kernel at a different place in memory, uh, I think every time it boots. And so a uh, Someone who's trying to attack the kernel, uh, trying to break into the kernel by knowing the offsets of things or the addresses of things, this is supposedly makes it harder. Of course, the big, uh, so that's actually a really nice feature, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to use that in, in embedded uh, systems. The big security issue that uh, everybody kind of heard about uh, was the heartbeat lead bug. This was uh, not a kernel issue. This was in the OpenSSL libraries. It was a very, very big problem. Uh, it was, and it was big because it was caused by a very old bug. So lots of systems were had this problem. Uh, and it was very easy to exploit. Uh, it was not very difficult at all. It was a lot of concern, the fact that it had been out there for so long. And it was in, undetectable. You, you could not tell if someone had exploited it. Other exploits, there were ways to uh, kind of track if they had been exploited, but not this one. 
And so there's a lot of concern that uh, a lot of critical systems were at risk. <clears throat> so the Linux Foundation, to its credit, stepped up and uh, actually created a new project, a fund for critical infrastructure projects. And you can read about that. So um, hopefully we'll be able to address some of these and make sure that some of these critical projects are not understaffed. That was kind of one of the observations, was that the OpenSSL really did not have as much resources assigned to it uh, working on it as it should. You know, for something that's as critical to worldwide infrastructure to have just a couple of volunteers, that didn't seem right. And so Linux Foundation will hopefully throw some money that way. Um, next slide. In terms of tracing, a uh, very interesting uh, thing that happened in this last year. So KTAP, I'm a big fan of KTAP. It does dynamic tracing uh, without the overhead of compiling a module, uh, which is what STAP uh, did. And KTAP uh, was going to give you uh, dtrace-like features without having to compile on your platform. That was always the problem with using system tap on embedded, because they never did get the cross-compilation right for embedded. Uh, and the way it did that is it adds an interpreter to the, to the kernel, and so it was an interpreted language, not a compiled language. And this actually got temporarily added to mainline in 3.13, but uh, people said, whoa, what happened? It was Greg Crow Hartman had added it to staging, and uh, it was subsequently removed. Ingo Mulder objected, and I think Stephen Rostad also did, uh, saying that it needed a little bit more work, uh, and you can, you can read about it. But I'm still hopeful to see that this goes in. The maintainer uh, who got it in said uh, he was going to address the objections that were raised. So hopefully this will, will um, we'll see this uh, upstreamed again sometime. Uh, so, ah, the device tree. So device tree, this is my, I don't know why I have my yarn bombing picture, uh, but uh, device tree. Uh, next slide. Uh, it continues its inexorable march. So uh, what that means is it, it's not going away. We're all just going to have to live with it and get used to it. All of the new SOC and most driver code needs to be BT compatible. That's, that's causing a big problem uh, for SOCs that do not have a lot of stuff upstream. So I've been working a lot on the Qualcomm port and um, even Qualcomm in 3.0 and 3.4, uh, their SOC support had some device tree stuff, but they needed a lot more integration with device tree. The same, same is true for a lot of other SOCs that are currently mainly out of tree. That includes things like uh, the All Winner or uh, MediaTek um, SOCs. They're all going to have to upgrade a lot of their drivers and stuff to work with DT. So it's it's really uh, in the short term, it's really causing a lot of uh, work to uh, bring those uh, drivers and board support forward uh, to new kernel versions. But it will hopefully be worth it in the end. Uh, one of the things that uh, if you worked on device tree, you know that it's got a problem uh, with the slightest syntax error. There's no there's not a lot of good checking syntax checking or uh, kind of validation. And so Thomas uh, Figa has, has worked on a validator. And he's got a proposal for how to do the schemas for that and gave a really good talk on this at ELC. Uh, you can kind of look at that. That will help. Uh, device trees, they're very error prone, or they can be. And uh, you really have to know what you're doing. Uh, we will have a lot more device tree talks coming up at Embedded uh, Linux Conference Europe. Uh, talking about security, dynamic trees, tutorials, under the hood documentation, stuff like that. So, uh, so if you are interested in device tree, make sure that you check out the ELC Europe stuff. Either come or just make sure you check out the slides after the event. So there'll be some good stuff. Um, let's see. I think uh, this is an old slide that I meant to delete. Sorry. <laughs> Move on. Okay. Okay, so CE workgroup project. So that's the major technology areas. So the CE workgroup contract work uh, for 2014, uh, this was uh, voted on the end of last year, I think. And we came up with uh, this contract work. There are eight projects. Uh, we have just a few underway. It's been really slow getting these started. Um, and it's kind of hard to say why. I, well, I can tell you why in a couple of them. But let me go through real quickly and give you an overview of each of them. So. Uh, the device tree documentation. Uh, so this is a, uh, a a project to oh not 
Oh, let's see. Did we miss a slide? Go back one. Oh, yeah, we did. Okay. Compress print K messages. So this is a system to try and compress the print K messages. Uh, as its name says, uh, a modern kernel will often have a couple hundred K of print K messages, and if we can compress those, we can save a lot of space. Uh, to get to really, really small systems, a lot of times people will cut those off, just omit them from the kernel, where there's a config option for that. But then you have no debugging capability. It's really hard to work with the kernel in that condition. Anyway, this one has actually made some progress. Wolfram Sang is the contractor here, and uh, he actually will be reporting his results at LinuxCon North America. Um, and I haven't seen his presentation yet. I should know what his results are already. But anyway, he, he's, uh, he's got a talk at LinuxCon, and, and uh, we'll be providing the status of that. Um, the other thing uh, that we wanted to work on was the LTI te LTSI test framework. Uh, this one got stalled mainly because we got kind of sidetracked evaluating different test frameworks. Uh, there, it was really hard to decide whether or not we should do this work on Lava, which is what the Yocto project seemed to be uh, consolidating on, or if we should do it based on Jenkins, which is what uh, Cogent had done some test frameworks on. And we ended up deciding to go back and just do it on Jenkins. Um, and uh, this will be for use with the LTSI kernel. Uh, the main feature that we're going to be doing is uh, board-independent deployment. So Jenkins has uh, quite a bit of good uh, materials for building kernels, and it's relatively easy to get the cross stuff going. But one of the areas where it's kind of weak, and they just kind of say, you know, fill in the blank here, is in deployment and control of the target systems. And so uh, based on TTC and some other things, uh, we've asked Cogent to uh, look at that and see if they can kind of wedge that in and fill that gap in Jenkins. Uh, so uh, I think that'll be useful work uh, for everybody in the long run. But even uh, Lenaro uses Jenkins, and so I think this uh, this will be applicable. Even if you're using Lava, you may get some value out of the work that we're planning to do here. Uh, and then uh, the next thing, device tree documentation. We finally got the contract written up for that. Frank Rowland is going to be the uh, contractor for it. He's already uh, started assembling the documentation for it, and we'll have a presentation at ELC Europe. This one seems to actually be moving along okay. Uh, the next one, which was the uh, override detection for kernel text and read-only data on the ARM platform, uh, it turns out that there was something that was already mainlined in, in uh, 314, so we may not need this project, and we need to check that out. And then the other project that I'm actually pretty excited about, but we haven't had time to start yet, um, is this thing about Android boot time improvements. Um, and the, the idea is that uh, you, it's really, really hard to speed up Android itself, but you might be able to speed up a portion of the Android stack, uh, particularly the native code, uh, if, you're, if you just want to get one piece of functionality up, like the backup camera uh, for automotive. Uh, and so the idea is that we'll do some kind of side, uh, we'll do kind of a rush portion of the stack where we'll get that up really quick uh, before the rest of Android loads and we can meet the constraints. The automotive industry, I think, has about a five second constraint on getting the backup camera working. And there are other products that have quick constraints you don't have to wait for the entire system to come up as long as you can provide a, a specific functionality uh, relatively quickly. But we have not started that work yet, so, but I am interested in <coughs> that going soon. The next slide. Uh, these last three projects, we really have, uh, they're, we haven't had the contractors uh, assigned to them yet, um, but uh, we wanted to do some CPU shielding that had to do with uh, uh, some real-time uh, work supporting real time. Um, also, the config NUMA for ARM uh, to allow handling some memory regions in a special way. Uh, and then more robust UBIFS support, trying to fix some robust issues uh, on UBIFS. Um, so that's the contract work. So, next slide. Okay, so this is. Uh, the, the, this is where my formatting really goes out the window, and I apologize for that. Um, but we decided in uh, CE Linux forum that we were going to, or the CE workgroup, that we were going to do some um, uh, new projects. Uh, and hopefully you can read these. Um, 
We're going to do them uh, based on uh, some steering committee meetings we had in May. Uh, our new project areas, we had a couple of new focus areas that we wanted to uh, work on. The four that have actually gotten some traction and we've actually seen some proposals uh, distributed around the forum so far are uh, a project involving the Internet of Things, a standardized distribution for embedded uh, Linux and social infrastructure, and uh, SOC mainlining. And there were some other projects that we've discussed, but we have not seen the proposals for those yet. So let me just talk real quickly about what we want to accomplish with each of these. So um, the first one is the Internet of Things. And the specific thing is that we really just want to identify the barriers to using Linux and IoT and fix any issues found. So right now, we know that one of the barriers is size. Uh, probably power management is, is kind of coupled to that if we're doing uh, small sensors that are uh, that need to last a long time on battery. The other issue, of course, the Internet of Things has a really, really big problem in the area of security. Uh, it's unclear, though, whether um, whether the CE work group needs to do work on that. Most of this is network security, which is already being addressed by some other standards organizations. And then um, another area which I didn't list here is uh, has to do with field upgradability, uh, long-term support. Um, and that may fall out as from some of our work in other areas. But uh, one of the things that may be part of this is reviving the Linux Tiny project. Uh, there's already a scheduled, or there will be scheduled, uh, a Birds of a Feather meeting at ELC Europe uh, to discuss uh, this project, the IoT, what the requirements are. And, and we'll kind of kick it off and go from there. So next slide. Um, the next uh, thing that the C Linux Forum is uh, investigating is doing a um, standard distribution. So we've all, we all share the kernel code. There's a standard kernel that we all use uh, from mainline. Uh, and we make our own private tweaks on that. But there's really not a standard distribution. There are some distributions out there that some there's commercial distributions, embedded Linux distributions that are available, but and there's some there's some other distributions, things like Angstrom or, or Pokey and um, Tizen. The the goal here would be to share the burden for maintaining a standard embedded distribution, uh, independent of uh, a commercial Linux vendor. Um, and actually, I'll discuss this a little bit more. This slides out of order, not previously, but more later on. Uh, next slide. Uh, another project that we're looking at is uh, Linux and social infrastructure. Uh, and so we want to uh, identify the issues with using Linux-based systems in social or societal infrastructure projects. Uh, and this has a, some overlap with uh, IoT issues. There's a lot of issues in this area uh, having to do with security, uh, upgradability, and particularly long long-term support uh, for systems that get built into infrastructure, things that are like sensors that are you know, on bridges or uh, actually built into um, long-term projects. There's a lot of issues here with how long does the software last, how secure does it need to be, um, how, how can it be upgraded. And so those are kind of the issues that we want to look at and see if there's a project uh, that we want, that we can do here that will be of value. And then next slide. The last one here is uh, SOC mainlining. So we still have a lot of work to do in order to get uh, the some of these ARM SOCs up, up uh, with get their board support upstream. And we'd like to continue as a group to help companies uh, figure out how to overcome any obstacles they have. Um, and uh, we want to do that with training and best practices documents and. And uh, we're still in the early stages of identifying what some of the barriers are. I mean, we kind of uh, intuitively know them, but we want to kind of be more formal about trying to tackle some of the issues having to do with uh, mainlining SOC code. So those are some of the uh, uh, projects that the CE workgroup is actually starting. And we're just initiating those uh, at the moment. These, I should say, that these projects are not yet uh, fully engaged. We are ne we're in the process of collecting requirements and uh, will probably be a solicitation for work group members, uh, kind of task force members to work on each of these areas. And we'll see how many of these can get some traction. 
Uh, but those are the four that we're looking at. We'll probably see some activity around those at LinuxCon and at ELC Europe. Um, so some other stuff. Uh, I'll just go quickly over a couple of tools, testing frameworks, build system distributions, and talk about the wiki. Um, so tools. Again, I apologize for the bad formatting. I don't know what happened to my formatting. Uh, but in an area of tools, one thing that I think is really interesting is um, the kernel. A lot of patches in the last year have gone into the kernel to allow it to support LLVM. And so having a separate tool chain that's capable of compiling a kernel, I think is really, really healthy. Uh, there are some capabilities that LLVM has that GCC does not. And so I think, I think that's uh, pretty nice. I, they're down to just, seriously, I think they're only down to about 20 patches. And they're kind of well-known things. Pretty easy to patch in support for LLVM compile a kernel these days. And then you can do a bunch of interesting things with the LLVM has a lot of back-end optimizers and things like that. Um, next slide. So uh, the other thing uh, that we're seeing a lot more interest in, in is testing frameworks. Uh, Kevin Hillman set up an automated test lab, and he's providing services to test a bunch of different uh, uh, ARM boards. Even if you're not a member of Lenaro, Kevin Hillman works for Lenaro. Uh, the other thing is that there's a lot of the, the kernel developers have expressed a lot of interest in making some automated test. Uh, test suites or some automated test uh, systems and building them actually into the kernel build system. So you could do something like make test and do some stuff. And for embedded, that's going to be a little bit trickier. We'd probably have to do something with emulators. But Steven Rostad has been working on something called ktest.pl um, to do automated testing. And um, I, think they'll, I think you'll see some interesting stuff coming out in the next uh, six months to a year. Uh, in terms of the kernel doing some automated testing and having support in mainline for that, uh, which would be really good. Next slide. Uh, build systems. So the two build systems that uh, seem to have a lot of activity around them uh, is the Octo Project. They continue to do a lot of uh, really great stuff. Um, uh, in the Octo Project, they seem to be focusing uh, quite a bit on something called the Toaster Project, uh, and that is their web-based interface. Uh, they're trying to uh, make things uh, easy to use, uh, which is good because Yocto is pretty complicated um, and can be hard to use. Uh, also, they're adding distributions. So they've got the micro Yocto, which is a kind of an IoT focused distribution. And uh, I found out that you can now compile Tizen uh, inside Yocto. Uh, so that is really interesting. Uh, I think some people have maybe been holding off on Tizen because uh, it had its own kind of uh, build system, but now that they're using, I guess what they call an industry industry de facto standard build system, uh, that should actually make it uh, uh, more approachable. Uh, then the other one is Buildroot, uh, and Buildroot continues to add uh, things. It's kind of a different. It builds images, it doesn't build packages. It takes package sources, but it builds outputs a single image. But they have some other tools uh, that I think are pretty nice. They've added a license compliance tool. You can add some attributes to the package definitions for license compliant. You can do rootFS overlays, uh, so you can customize the image after it's built. They've added some Eclipse plugins, uh, so you can take uh, the materials that uh, the build root builds, and then uh, you plug your tool chain into Eclipse and, and use that uh, for cross development. Also, they have, uh, it's pretty easy to use, they have dev configs for lots of popular dev boards. And um, the, let's see, package dependency graph and build time graph. <coughs> so, oh, all of these tools, when you get, when you end up with tons of packages, a lot of times uh, when you're building, you, you kind of are not getting what you expect. And so to, to kind of dig into it and see why is uh, such and such a package getting built and included, uh, there's a lot of, uh, in the case of Buildroot, these are visualization tools that can show you uh, a little graph of uh, what's what depends on what and what is causing what else to be built. So those are nice tools uh, being added to Buildroot. Uh, and then distributions. So distributions, because the CE workgroup is uh, contemplating uh, doing a possible standard of better distributions, these are, these are kind of interesting. So let's take a look at kind of what distributions are out there. So there's Pokey, or Pocky. I know. Next slide. Um, 
this is a default distribution used by the Octo project. And again, I apologize, the, this is so small a print. Hopefully you can read it. Uh, the Octo project keeps trying to avoid shipping, <coughs> but they do have this sample distribution that's built in. Uh, it's unclear whether it's suitable for production. I think you could, probably could use it for production in some products. Uh, anyway, but, uh, but they don't recommend that. Um, if you look at kind of the major distribution, uh, next slide, if you look at the major distribution that comes out of the Open Embedded and Yakto project, uh, it's a really mature uh, package feed based distribution, that's Angstrom. Uh, this is mature, it's been maintained for years and years, it's at least, uh, it's, I think it's at least eight years old, maybe nine years old. It was originally focused on handheld devices like the Sharp Zaras. Uh, and it was actually the original distribution that uh, was built with Open Embedded, or you could actually say that the other way. Open Embedded was built to build uh, what is now Angstrom. It was called something else before, but uh, this is just with a number of development boards. I think it's a pretty solid distribution, and it continues to uh, continues to be used in a lot of places. Uh, the next one is MicroYocto. This is a brand new distribution that I already talked about. Uh, this has uh, focused on IoT requirements, so it's focused on the very, very low end, has uh, and has a lot of kind of interesting features uh, for uh, using a user space IC, IP stack and for configuring out. Um, it, anyway, it has special features for tiny systems <coughs> and a bunch of kernel patches that are kind of the modern equivalent of Linux Tiny, although they're not called that, and special tracing for dynamic memory usage. Um, and so this is, this is an interesting distribution for some segments of the market. Uh, next slide. And then there's Tizen, and I think Tizen is actually pretty interesting. Um, it's descended from uh, Migo, which in turn descended from Mimo and Moblin. Um, it's starting to get more widespread usage. So Samsung had its own operating system called Bada, or, or Linux-based distribution rather, called Bada. And they've actually replaced that, as near as I can tell, with Tizen. And uh, this is shipping in TVs and phones, and you can tell from uh, looking at the, uh, the things that, that people are talking about that they're using it uh, in automotive, or at least targeting it in automotive. Uh, the interesting news here is that it can be built with the Octo Project. I said that already, but um, this means, I believe, that it could be a serious competitor as a general embedded distribution. I think this ought to be a real candidate to look at uh, for a standard embedded distribution. Um, so that's, that's pretty interesting. There'll be a couple of ties and talks at ELC year. And then of course, uh, we should talk about Android. I don't, I don't consider Android an embedded operating system. It really is kind of the desktop of this century. Um, but you can use Android in non-mobile devices. You can use it kind of in the embedded world. You can run it headless. Uh, that's what, uh, there's a talk by Gary uh, Beeson. Uh, if you Google cyborg stack or headless Android, you can find a lot of resources on that. Uh, so people are running it even on systems that don't have uh, graphics or, or they have some kind of alternate form of graphics. Uh, if you look at the, the releases, the latest releases of Android, just kind of say what's going on recently. So KitKat was actually not out a very long time. Uh, its major focus was size. Um, so Android had kind of increased over the years, gotten a little bit uh, big, and uh, so you could, Google wanted to refocus it and be able to, if possible, uh, or if, if desired, to ship it on devices with only 512 meg of RAM um, to allow them to drop Android into lower end phones. And I think they did a pretty good job. There's uh, some tuning you can do at Android Builder Summit. There's some there's some good talks on how to tune Android. Um, but that was the focus of KitKat. Now the L release, which I don't know the name of, I don't think uh, anyone outside of Google does yet, that has a lot of new changes coming up. Uh, I don't know when this is going to be released, but a couple of the kind of the interesting changes coming up are Project Volta. So now that they've done size, they want to go uh, look at power reduction, and that is that would be really good. Uh, they have a new 3D look with floating widgets uh, called Material Design. I think that's of interest to maybe users and developers, not so much for system programmers. Um, for system programmers, the really big thing here is uh, the switch over to ART, the Android runtime. 
And that is, uh, so that is, they're going to be saying goodbye to the virtual machine. They're just going to do a straight ahead of time compiler. The art was available in uh, KitKat, but it was not the default. And uh, But in the L release, uh, it will be the default. So um, I, for one, will not miss uh, having a virtual machine. I think it was terribly inefficient. Uh, so we should see some good speed. Uh, improvements. Uh, I'm not sure about compatibility, but I, if they're making the default, I assume they fixed uh, any compatibility issues. So that's actually pretty big news uh, from a system standpoint. Uh, that'll change things. That may have a big impact uh, on things like boot time uh, as well. Um, next slide. And then finally, we have this uh, possible standard embedded uh, Linux distribution. I already talked about this, but the we are having a, a C workgroup project to create and maintain a standard distribution. And we're just getting started with the requirements definition. Uh, we may select an existing distribution, kind of uh, push our efforts towards that. If you are interested in this, uh, please contact uh, Yoshitaki Kobayashi. Oh, I don't know, is uh, Kobayashi-san there no, today? No, I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, he cannot attend this. Uh, OK. Well, if anybody asks, you can give him his email address. Sure. Uh, let's see. The last thing I want to talk about, I think, I think this is last, is the Elix Wiki. Uh, we continue to put material up there, which we hope is useful uh, for people working on Linux. Um, a lot of the pages, uh, some of them are old, but they're still useful. I was talking about the boot time. Some of the boot time techniques, you still manually use those same techniques. Uh, preset LPJ. That was one of the first pages we put on the wiki, and it's still useful today. Um, we are working on a couple of wiki projects, um, trying to do the video transcription project. You can email me if you want to get involved with that. Um, but we continue to put material out there. Every time we have a conference, we try to collect up all the slides. Uh, sometimes the conference pages uh, disappear. That happened recently with one of the other conferences. And so it's good to make sure we get this stuff saved so we can go back and look at it. Uh, so hopefully this is a good resource. Uh, please feel free to, to add your own information and your material out there uh, to make it a resource we can all share. And then finally, next slide, just in terms of the resources that I use for this presentation, uh, I use lwn.net. Uh, if you are not subscribed, you should do that because it's a very, very valuable resource for the industry. I also use the Colonel Newbies page. Um, I, I do a lot of research just by looking at uh, the slides from uh, ELC and ELC Europe um, on elinux.org. There's a ton of great information out there. And if, you, uh, if you're if you wading into a new area, uh, then you should definitely check out uh, the slides from, from those events. So just by way of example, I recently started working on some uh, USB stuff. And uh, there's a bunch of really useful uh, presentations on the eLinux Wiki covering USB and the ConfigFS interface and how it all works uh, saved me lots of time. So really, really good, uh, uh, useful information out there. And then the eLinux dev mailing list. Uh, occasionally, you'll see some good stuff there. Anyway, uh, that's all I've got. Next slide. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? <laughs> Well, uh, Tim, I have a question about uh, I got a uh, question about uh, the uh, closing date of the session proposal of the uh, e uh, ELC Europe. Can you remember yes. the date? Uh, yes, the closing date was um, unfortunately already passed. It, it it was I think it was the it was a week ago Friday. I don't remember what day that was. I see. I think it was the eleventh. Mm -hmm. So I missed. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you had a, did you have a proposal in? No, I haven't. I guess not. Okay. Sure. Eh, yeah. Okay, I think uh, it's time to end this session. Okay, IoT is coming something uh, quite, you know, uh, controversial or some of the uh, exciting for the discussion. Uh, I think uh, for the IoT uh, people, they will start some discussion of the uh, uh, selection of the operating system, they will start telling some of the advan advantage of the uh, another in operating system, like uh, you know, a real-time operating system or something, and Linux. 
Uh, what do you think about the uh, advent advantage of Linux or use of IoT? So this is this is a really good question, and I, I think it's a very fair question. Uh, people, uh, I, I gave a, my keynote at ELC was on IoT and uh, whether Linux made sense in that space. And actually, some of the best arguments I saw for this uh, were in Vitaly Wool's presentation. So, uh, but the basic idea is that um, it is currently uh, a lot of work to get Linux running in these really, really low-end systems, these microcontrollers. Um, and it's kind of hard to justify that work if you have uh, other, things, um, uh, other things available for them. But there are a couple of key advantages that Linux does have. Uh, one is that you've got an active, uh, you've got an active developer base. So uh, when, this won't be true of kind of older microcontrollers, but as you get more modern microcontrollers, if they're dealing with, for instance, more modern networking stacks, like Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, you're gonna see that support first on Linux. And so uh, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be easier to use Linux to support newer networking stacks uh, than it will be with other RTOSs. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there's a wealth of information uh, available on Linux uh, that you can use. Uh, there are all kinds of books. So there's a whole ecosystem of support available for Linux that might not be available for uh, other operating systems. <coughs> and then the third thing is that Linux is a full-featured POSIX OS. And so if you have any existing software, a lot, a lot of times you're doing custom work in IoT, but if you have any existing software that you want to pull in, uh, you know it's going to work on Linux, and you won't have to spend a lot of time debugging that part of the interface. So in terms of like the syscalls, the, the kind of the core POSIX APIs that any software might be written to, uh, you know that it's going to be really solid on Linux. So there's, there's just three reasons why Linux, I think, makes sense. But it does have to be weighed against the, um, the cost of doing Linux, and right now it's it's uh, pretty hard. I mean, Vitaly Wool can make Linux run in 256k of SRAM, but I don't know if I don't know if there's very many other people who can do that. So, and that's what we uh, should fix if we can get stuff mainlined and get some other people interested. In, we can make it easier for for uh, uh, developers to do that. So I think the uh, most you know advantage of Linux for use of IoT is again some of the power of openness of the uh, intelligence of the uh, global people uh, assembling within the Linux world. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you. Uh, yes, I don't know if there's any questions. Okay, anyway, uh, this afternoon we have another session uh, performed by Mizuyama-san, and he's, taught, he's uh, going to make a repeat of the uh, keynote speech in the last Automotive Linux Summit. And he's also uh, try to say something quite important thing to deal with the Linux community or, or open community. Not write the specification, but write the code. That's something uh, quite essential in discussion. Um, okay. Anyway, thank you very much, Tim, and have a good weekend. Okay, you too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So.